and it's this is the this is the ship and it's an amazing story of people not speaking truth to power so over here is the vasa you kind of see the shape of it I two it. decks of cannons kind of a skinny ship this is the uss constitution only one cannon deck but you can see also how much fatter it, it is down here in the belly of the ship and how much more weight room there is for ballast as opposed to the vasa and, and it was a really cool story because they knew there was a problem but everyone was afraid to tell the king kind of a deal no, no that is a wonderful story um that reminds me of the thresher uh is that similar and that people knew beforehand or with the thresher was it really people found out when it sunk Yeah, I think there were le there were fewer indicators in the case of the Thresher. Thresher was more of a surprise. Uh, I don't put it in the same category as as this. Th th this is in the same category as like Boeing seven thirty seven Max and uh, any other corporate issues where they make a decision based on everyone knows it's the right the co the corporate culture isn't sufficiently robust for people to say this isn't a good idea even though now we see their text from some of the test pilots saying the software is going crazy yeah, no the max is something we covered extensively at rebellion and we were very disappointed with how boeing managed that program and i've probably spoken to dozens now of boeing uh, employees off the record and the general consensus was that they really just tried to have engineers uh, you know, programming engineers uh, patch up a hard, you know, a hardware engineering issue, and that you know these engines were, you know, poorly designed, and so they tried to you know counter that with their uh, software program, and then they didn't even want to give the software program for free; they wanted to charge like two million dollars for it, uh, and then they didn't give a good enough tutorial on it. I mean, the the list of critical errors goes on and on with the, with the Max program. Yeah, it's been a disaster, and. I'm and ever since, you know, we got this string of Jack Welsh protégés who think they're Jack Welsh and they're just jerks, basically. And we got another one in there now saying, he's been on the board for 10 years. He goes, oh, it's so much worse than I thought. I mean, really? You're fired, dude. So let's back jump, uh, jump back to the Thresher because, you know, I always find the Thresher okay. interesting. And not just because, you know, little known fact that the, you know, person who found the Titanic actually used funding from the Navy uh, to find the Thresher. The deal was if, they, you know, if you found the Thresher that you could then go and find the Titanic. And so yeah, I would Woods Hole. Woods Hole up in, uh, so I grew up in, in uh, Massachusetts and Woods Hole up there, Cape Cod was, was the uh, Ballard, right? Yep. Oh, yes. Ballard. Exactly. Ballard. Yep. Yeah. So Woods Hole was was the Oceanographic Institute up there, and uh, they had government money, and then uh, they funded it. Yeah, no, no. That I mean, do you think you learned a lot from the Thresher, or? Yeah, the Navy learned a lot. So what happens is, in a submarine, uh, there's a lot of seawater inside the submarine running through pipes. We we bring water into the submarine and send it back out. We use that to cool all the machinery. It's more than the more than you would think. So there are all these penetrations, and when one of those internal pipes broke, so the first thing is you want fast closing valves on these penetrations, and those weren't designed robustly enough. Then when you want an emergency blow, which is what the ship did, you're taking high pressure air, passing it through a pipe, sending it into the ballast tank. So it's rapid de decompression. Mm -hmm happened was the air as it was doing that froze up the moisture in the air froze into ice and so it couldn't pass through the pipe anymore so out of that came a whole bunch of rules about keeping we do like hourly checks on these on this air banks to make sure the moisture is very 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 low we redesign these pipes so that they're fatter they're, the piping runs are shorter and then there was a bunch of uh, work around controlling the materials used in the submarine. So there's a lot of stuff you take for granted. When you, you get a set of, you get, you get a, uh, drugs from Walgreens, you assume if it says amoxicillin, you assume it's amoxicillin. Yeah. Uh, in the Navy, 
we test it to make sure and we and there's a pedigree behind these things so we learned a lot we only had one accident after that which was the scorpion mm -hmm. that was a different kind of accident but uh i think we owe a lot to the to the guys on the thresher i, I uh, never realized how connected the thresher and the challenger were and that they both had you know a uh, cold cause you know uh malfunctioning products on board which caused a you know fatal crash for both instances yeah i mean the challenger what a sad thing where you you see the engineers the transcripts of the engineers basically saying this is a problem and the guys management not wanting to hear it in fact there was one at one point the one of the managers says take your engineering hat off and put your management hat on and oh my god when do you want me to launch you know april and reagan was going to he was doing a State of the Union address, and they were going to launch 12 shuttle launches every month. There was going to be a shuttle launch, and so we're getting near the end of January. So it's what we call obey the clock. It's the obey the clock play, which is the pressure of getting the thing out overrides the integrity of the engineering and the organization, if it's not robust enough, succumbs to that. Yeah, no. Couldn't agree more. Well, speaking of the clock, uh, there's been a lot of concern regarding, uh, you know, this kind of 10 year window in the Navy where we're going to have a lack of submarines. Mm. Do you have a comment on that? Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't really follow the Navy force structure that closely. Okay. Submarines are, I mean, I'm a submariner, so I'm biased, but I think they're a fantastic weapon. Yeah. So, no, I mean, uh, so the National Interest uh, wrote a piece uh, recently saying that between 2030 and 2040, uh, the Chinese are going to have a greater advantage in submarine warfare than the U.S. And, you know, with surface-to-air missiles, you know, surface ships are pretty much obsolete at this point. So in a conflict, submarines are really everything for us. Well, yeah, I think, so, you know, again, I'm by a submarine. Submarines are very, very important. So what, when you build a submarine, it's going to last 30 to 35 years. Uh, our, we try and keep them 33 years, and the reactor core lasts that long. So these are long lead items, and it takes 10 years to design and build a new submarine. So this is not something you can decide, oh, we need a bunch of submarines, go buy them tomorrow. I mean, there's no, and it's even worse because once the industrial uh, um, capability atrophies. Mm -hmm. You can't hire people. Like there's no other market. If I, if, I, if I'm looking for software engineers, yeah, I can hire them from some other place. But if I'm looking for people who do submarine welding, and we're not doing, we're not keeping those people employed normally. So it's sort of a very stable business. It's 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 uh, concerning. I am not that concerned um, about the Chinese. They have great. They've got able to buy some great technology but uh and and these numbers are old but they're probably still about right if you look at a typical u.s submarine and over on average our submarines will spend 150 days at sea every year mm -hmm. something like that the typical chinese submarine is spending about 15 days at sea every year so they have a lot of submarines, but a lot of them don't spend much time at sea. So they're not, they don't have the ability to go to sea for long periods of time. They're so not practicing it. It's not a cost saving endeavor. It's just a, they don't have the ability to stay, you know, to go all over the world. Yeah, yeah, they don't. Uh, so, you know, they have to take parts from two or three submarines to make one of them work. So those other submarines can't go to sea. When they go to sea, it's kind of a big deal. Uh, maybe they take crews from other ships. They're getting better. But again, with the Russians and the submarines, people say, well, they have so many submarines. They have 200 submarines, whatever the number is. Yeah, but if you look at how much time they spend at sea, it's less than what we do with our 50 attack submarines. So it's not, it's not something not to be concerned about, but it's not, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't quite be alarmist about the thing. But a submarine is an asymmetric weapon. Their submarines are, are there to attack and kill our aircraft carriers. Our submarines are there 
to conduct surveillance on them and to sink if they if they want to invade Taiwan. Our submarines are there to sink that invasion fleet. So do you still feel we have the advantage over the Chinese military or do you feel it's even or can you not comment on that? Well, uh, I can comment. I'm not sure. I, it, it depends. Like if you said, could the United States invade mainland China and take Shanghai? No, of course not. But can the Chinese do an amphibious invasion of Taiwan? I don't think so. I think we could prevent that from happening. Yes, yes. That's a wonderful uh, answer. Thank you. So, so now the problem is it's sort of bear, boiling the frog. And when I was a submarine commander in the Pacific, we'd go over there and the Chinese are doing things like they're just dumping pa millions of pounds of concrete on what used to be like a submerged island and mm -hmm. building it up to make it an actual island. And then they say, oh, that's Chinese territory. And then they put a 200 mile circle around it and say, oh yeah, all the oil in that area. And so it, uh, down in the Spratly Islands, in the uh, South China Sea, there's a bunch of oil down there in Vietnam, Philippines, China, it's in that area. And the Chinese are just saying, yeah, no, that's ours now. So that's, that's a bit concerning. Yeah, no, I, I definitely have heard those concerns as well. And so how do you see AI coming to play in submarines over the future? Yeah, I think uh, uh, like everything else is gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. So our experience was, here's how we experienced AI. It was it's sort of like a cruise control on your car. Mm -hmm. So we could set the submarine co um, course. We could put that in automatic. The submarine depth in automatic. If you're deep, it, it's pretty good. When you get shallow, sometimes if you're interacting with the surface, the AI, the AI couldn't keep up. Uh, but the problem is people, for me, they are thinking about it a little bit. Uh, the way I think about it is there's the thought process and then a decision and then the implementation of the decision. AI to me worked really well after the decision was made. Got it. The level of AI that we had wasn't so great at making a decision. So for example, I could say, I want the submarine to go on course 180 and then we could input that into the AI and then the AI would do really well with that. The AI coming back and analyzing everything and saying, hey, I think we should go on course 180 that it was hard to trust the AI uh, to do that. But I'm talking, this is like 10, 10 to 15 years ago. So uh, for me, AI is good at implementing, we call it the red work. It's the implementation of the decision, which is the blue, the thinking work. No, I mean, you know, when it comes to AI and submarines, uh, you know, often people make jokes about, uh, you know, the failed $200 million computer in the hunt for the red October that thinks the, um, it's a displacement whale something, you know, yeah. um, but you know, Scotty doesn't believe it. Uh, remember, uh, so, you know, uh, AI definitely gets a, a bad rap. Uh, are you a fan of hunt for the red October? May I ask? I think uh, that's a great movie. Great movie. Yeah. It's, it's gotta be my personal favorite, uh, submarine movie. Uh, yeah. Uh, definitely. Uh, was any part of it not factually correct in terms of how they did things? I mean, if you had to point anything out, I apologize. None of it was factually correct. <laughs> Perfect. Fantastic. Great answer. But, but, but the sense, the sense of um, tension, uncertainty, and ambiguity in that movie is better than, than most. What mm -hmm. most people don't understand, I mean, you're a math, mathematician, so... Mm -hmm. Think of the, you think of the world in, 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 in kind of a probabilistic way. Exactly. And, and so most people's experience of life is I'm driving down the highway, there's a truck in front of me, half a mile in front of me. I see the brake lights come on and the truck starts getting bigger. And in my mind, uh, that's like I'm getting closer to the truck because it all makes, it's all correlates, it makes sense. And it's, it's very certain, there's no ambiguity about what's going on. The way submarining works is the brake lights come on, but the truck gets smaller. And there's a lot of ambiguity. And, and by the way, I'm not even sure it's a truck. It might be a school bus. And because you can't see things, but we're so used to this visual cueing and the certainty that comes with that, that when you take all that away, it's very unsettling. So we all talk in terms of probabilities. Yeah, it's an 80% chance that the enemy is here, but there's 20% chance they're not. 
And whether we're right, whether it's really a 10% or a 30%, doesn't, that, that doesn't really matter so much as the sense that we're not 100% certain about anything. So we're always testing, probing, confirming, that kind of thing. Even when you shoot a torpedo, the finally, final question I would have for my sonarman is, is, is how sure are you that this is the enemy? And he yeah. might say 30%, and I would say shoot anyway. I mean, yeah. it depends on the mission. Got it. Yeah, no, actually, the primary AI we build at rebellionresearch.com is probabilistic AI, which was only invented in 1991 by a professor at UCLA. And so, you know, we're never sure of any specific uh, investment. You know, we believe in the aggregate. Uh, every stock at, at best has a 65 to 70% chance of success. And, um, you know, at, at the same time, we know every decision could be wrong. And so when you know every decision could be wrong, you tend to come up with a more hedged product. So, uh, yeah, and, there, and there's, there's this humility of you're, more, you're interested in diverse opinions. Where people get into trouble is they think it's a deterministic world and they're somehow in charge of it. And, and they're not interested in the dissent. We call them dissenting and diverse opinions. Why? Because they're rooted in this, you know, one zero binary world, which is not the real world. Oh, you're I was, so I did an event with a uh, private equity group and it was founded by a bunch of guys who were poker players way back when. And uh, they, they're doing real well. And the uh, CEO told me I hire, it's easier for me to hire a physicist or a mathematician who thinks probabilistically and teach them about the markets than to hire some analyst and teach them how to think probabilistically. That's funny. You know, the uh, coach of uh, Indiana, Bobby Knight, uh, apparently used to throw basketballs and, and say, okay, the first 11 to get the basketballs makes the team. I just want the quickest guys out there. I can teach you how to play. So, yeah, you know, right. Similar logic. Right. Yeah, definitely. So how about female integration in submarines? Uh, where do you see that happening and when and at all? Yeah, it's happening. Uh, in the U.S., I think we've had them for 10 years, 10 or 15 years. So we have, basically, there's two kinds of submarines. Uh, with airplanes, you have fighter planes and bombers, and you have the same kind of thing with submarines. You have the fighter planes, like the ship I was on, uh, which is pictured here, the Santa Fe. That's mm -hmm. one of the fighters. That's a hunter killer, we probably would call it. And then the bombers are the big ballistic missile submarines that hide with the multiple thermonuclear warhead missiles. And uh, those submarines are bigger, and that, those are the ones that we're putting women on because they have the physical space that we can accommodate. Uh, the, 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 we can make the accommodations appropriate. So, but I think the plan is, yeah, you know, I don't know. I, I think there might be heading towards putting them on all, so all the submarines. I'm going to jump to our defense. You know, in 1945, 44, there was a Nazi submarine in Long Island Sound they, that was apprehended by the FBI. Uh, how much better are our defenses? I mean, if a submarine came within 10 miles of the U.S., would we know about it? Uh, I'd say uh, probably about a 90% chance we'd know about it. Okay. We're looking for well, ten miles. That's inside territorial water, so that would be a foul by anyone. So, are we constantly pinging the waters outside of New York to see what's there? Or, I mean, no, I don't think so. Okay, it'd be a, kind of a waste of time and money. It, it, it's kind of like this: if you look in the other guy's locker room and you count twelve players, and there's twelve guys on the team, and there's twelve guys in the locker room, why bother? You know, there's no one out hiding outside your door. When when one now you count one day and there's 11 guys in the locker room now you start you so start. surveillance of the sub base is really what's imperative you start at that end yeah the other end yep. if you're trying to catch them outside of new york harbor you're already lost gotcha we would find them outside of their harbor and shoot them so let's talk about how about your scariest um or did you did you have a story when you were a captain that uh you know, made you uh, worried for your own survival, or was it never? Were you never faced with a situation like that? Well, we had some scary times. Most most of them you can't really talk about. I I had a scary moment 
this is more of a philosophically scary moment. When I got to the submarine, I was trained to go to a different submarine. Mm -hmm. Very last minute, I said, okay, you're going to be the captain of the Santa Fe. And it was a different kind of submarine. And everyone was trained to do what the captain told them. And so when I would say things, even though I say, now, if this doesn't seem right, tell me. And then I would give an order uh, and they would do it. And then it would come out later. It's like, well, that was boneheaded. Why did you guys do it? Oh, you told us. I said, yeah, but I told you guys to speak up. So the problem isn't them speaking up. The problem isn't people giving bad orders. The problem is giving orders. So I had to create a team where they would come to me and say, hey, here's what we intend to do. Here's what we plan to do. You stop us if you don't like it. But Okay. We're not gonna we're not gonna rely on you to tell us what to do, and that was a really amazing journey. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much for you know coming on today, and uh, we really appreciate your time. This was awesome. Cheers. Thank you. Take care. Awesome. Bye. Have a great day, Captain.